from KCRW. This is a podcast about love and fear and loss and science and wondering whether you missed some crucial memo about how the world works. Those things that make you toss and turn at night the same way you always have. But this, this is a podcast about waking up the next morning, sitting bolt upright in bed with defiance and saying out loud to no one in particular, life is wonderful and life is strange and terrifying and I will not waste mine on my own exaggerated fears. This is a podcast about the disgusting and the unknowable and the sublime. This is Here Be Monsters, the eighth season. I'm Jeff Entman, and my co-producer is Bethany Denton, and for the next nine months, we'll share with you another 20 stories. You know, stuff about bull castration and water witching, deep sea exploration and auras. So welcome. We're glad you're here for it. Now I want to tell you something about my parents' house. This is what it sounds like on the front porch of my parents' house, facing due north. It's a sound that never felt out of place when I grew up, but with a decade of separation in city life, I think the sound is actually pretty wild. I find it kind of haunting, actually. I went out there this summer while the podcast was on break, and I stood on the front deck again, and I saw a wide field of hay split in half by a long, straight driveway that points due north. There are hills covered there with peas and lentils and canola and wheat. And those hills, they're everywhere and endless. They look like those little ripples of silt that form on a pond's edge. The topsoil there is thick, and it's rich with nutrients and worms, and beneath the worms there's quartzite and granite with veins of groundwater running through them, and beneath the rocks there are melted rocks, and beneath the melted rocks there is metal, the earth's molten core, a ball of liquid iron spinning and swirling inside the planet like a deep and unknown magnetic ocean. But back on the surface, there are cars. And those cars drive fast on the highways that sneak between the hills. The road outside my parents' house is gravel. And most folk, the city folk, they don't know how to handle it. As the pavement ends, they bump into the soft gravel on the other side. They kick up giant plumes of dust behind them. They white-knuckle on the tens and twos. And the road's edge tugs on their tires. It's a hard feeling to describe, but I felt it too. At my parents' house, maybe once per summer, some unfortunate driver succumbs to the tugging sensation of the gravel. The pull grows too strong, and they realize it too late. Instinctively, they jerk the wheel leftwards, overcorrect, and then find themselves tail up in the opposing ditch. My dad lives for this moment. He's the helpful type, grew up on a farm. I've still never met anyone who could get into coveralls faster. He'll suit up and coax the old tractor to life, and then he'll rattle off down the road to pull them out, check their vitals, teach them about the magnetic nature of gravel roads, how hungry those ditches can be. But that's the outlier. Most people don't wind up in the ditch. Most of them do the right thing when the magnet starts to pull. They ease back on the gas, reciprocate pressure on the wheel, and move to the center of the road, where the gravel's shallower. But even the good drivers drive too fast. They always have and they always will. Despite the endless march of time, the progressive grind of erosion, the changing of society's norms and morals, people will always drive too fast on that gravel road in front of the house. It's just one of those rare natural constants.
we'd eat our dinner on the front porch. Meatloaf and ketchup, steamed garden carrots, summer squash and dinner rolls with margarine, big glasses of milk. The plume of gravel dust from another car would appear between the hills and one of us would inevitably say, now that looks like someone who's going to wind up in the ditch. the stars came out, and the snow soaked up all the noise. And sometimes, at night, when the moon was just new enough, and the molten core flowed just so, and the sun flared just right, and it was just cold enough out, I'd hear my dad yelling for me outside. I'd put on shoes and run into the driveway, and he'd point my head towards the northern sky. And up there, there'd be these giant green curtains there, flickering dimly, the northern lights. They weren't bright enough to be vivid in and of themselves, but they were bright enough to seem righteous and good and godly. I've never seen the magnetism on full display, though. I've only ever seen the dim green fluttering. I've heard that if you go farther north, you can see more colors, and the farther you go, the brighter they get. These days, the closest you can get is Ellesmere Island in Canada, home to caribou and musk ox and the arctic bumblebee. And yeah, it's also home to the planet's strongest magnetism, which shoots through the Earth's surface there and envelops us in a layer of magnetosphere that protects us from cosmic rays. It's a giant force field. It's a colorful screensaver, and we are the screen. You see, the Earth is a magnet, and Ellesmere Island is one tip of that magnet, the magnetic North Pole. And so every compass in the world aligns with Ellesmere. My dad showed me once. We were out there on the front deck, and he brought out his compass and set it on the deck railing, and he showed me how our house nearly perfectly aligned with the compass's red needle. And I don't really know why that moment plays so strongly in my memory. I guess I used to think that it might mean something, that our house was built that way for a reason. But yeah, I guess some things just make more sense when you're a kid. Of course, there's another north, and that other north we call true north, though I take issue with that term. The true North Pole is the axis that the Earth spins on. And the true North Pole isn't on any actual landmass, it's just on a pile of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. And there's actually quite a bit of distance between that North and the other one. These days it's about 300 miles. And it's really important to remember that there are two Norths. The North on your map, that's true North. But the North on your compass, that's magnetic North. And where I'm from, the difference between those two is about 14 degrees. It's not much, but it's enough to get you lost if you're not paying attention. You have to compensate with your compass. You have to twist this little ring on the housing that offsets everything by just the right amount. This is called setting a declination. And again, where I'm from, to set your declination, you twist the compass ring 14 degrees clockwise. But if you live in El Paso, you twist it 8 degrees clockwise. And if you live in Cape Town, you twist it 25 degrees counterclockwise. And if you live in Paris or Jakarta, you don't twist it at all because you're in one of those few places in the world where you form a nearly perfect line with the two poles. Declinations are about knowing the difference between what your compass feels and what your map says. And I can identify with that. I've certainly felt that way before. Sometimes people tell you up is down, left is right, right is wrong, north is south, or north is other north. When I was a kid, I cared a lot about what was right and true. Standing in the driveway in winter, watching creation flash green in the sky above me, I thought that I might be part of a righteous cosmic plan, a plan assigned to me from heaven. And I thought that maybe if I just lived my life just right, things would go my way. The girl in my class would like me back. My parents would buy me a Game Boy. My cat would stop eating meat. I'd get good at sports, and I'd be so strong and fast that when I ran, it would be like stopping time, and everyone would like me. I thought that I might be able to save the world if only I could align my morals just right, pray the right prayers, do the right deeds, and twist that ring in just the right way. So I dedicated myself to getting closer to God. It's possible I was lost back then. I certainly am now. Just in different ways, I think. Psalm 19. 
The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Here Be Monsters, the podcast about The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. The podcast about The Unknown. One spring, I talked to angels. I was a seventh grader and I was down at the river, biking with the Boy Scouts. I was weaker than the rest of them, and I kept falling behind. Eventually, they got tired of waiting for me, so they biked on ahead back to the campsite. I was alone, and on the brink of exhaustion as the sun set. I biked for a long time, and when I was nearly back to the campsite, the trail finally turned downhill, and I coasted, and for a moment it felt nice. The cool dusk air blessed me and I loosened my grip on the handlebars. But I stopped paying attention for just a moment and the trail bent unexpectedly and I flew off its outer edge into a picnic shelter. And I was already over the handlebars by the time I saw the big table. My leg hit the aluminum hard and there was no one there to hear the sound it made. And for some period of time, I lay on the table spread-eagled, shocked, and bleeding. And then there were two angels, no wings or halos, just two half-bald men with t-shirts and shorts. They picked me up off the table and helped me clean up my leg, showed me how to put pressure on the wound until the bleeding slowed. They checked to see if the bone was broken. It wasn't. And they stayed with me until my whole body stopped shaking. And I never thanked them because they disappeared again before I regained the ability to speak. I looked for them, but they were gone. So I walked the rest of the way back to camp, still oozing blood, wheeling a wrecked bicycle. And when I told the scout leaders that angels had saved me, I don't think they laughed, but I know they didn't believe me either. For he will give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. The church camp I went to was pretty far out there. The sort of place where newspapers showed up a day late, and getting cell service meant hiking up one of the giant mountains that surrounded the village. Retrofitted school buses carried church groups up from the ferry landing, depositing them daily to experience serenity in a holy place. I really liked it there. I've talked about this spot before, how I moved there for my junior year of high school. You don't like need to pause this episode and go listen to that or anything, but you should, at some point, Listen to episode 41. It's called Crossing the River, Being Watched. But I want to tell you about something that I didn't talk about on that episode. Something that happened in the village, high in a tree. It's something I don't talk about often, but something that I've never stopped thinking about. Not even now, half my life later. To understand it though, you have to know something about me as a teenager. I felt purpose for moving to the village. I thought it might cleanse me spiritually, rid me of sin, get me closer to God. I thought perhaps it might be the first step towards seminary and eventual pastorhood. And I mean, all this is true, but also take it with a big grain of salt. I was 16 at the time, so it also seemed pretty great to spend a year without the supervision of parents. I arrived in the fall carrying two giant plastic bins of all my belongings. And for the next nine months, I went to school five days a week, church seven days a week, and I ate 21 communal meals per week in the dining hall. But I had a problem, a heartache problem. It was one of my classmates and I liked her a lot. She was a beautiful artist, she danced when she walked, and sometimes she even thought my jokes were funny too. 
Within a week, my mind was made up, and I did the one thing that you should never do during the first week of knowing anyone. I imagined a future for us. And in this future, I was a pastor, beloved equally by my congregation and by her and by God himself. And she, she was an incredible painter, just like her mother, beloved by her patrons, beloved by me, beloved by our three vegetarian cats. It was an idyllic fantasy, it was ridiculous, but I didn't know it because I was 16 and I was setting myself up for a lot of disappointments. It was fall and the weather was already changing. Morning dew became morning frost. The deciduous tamarack pines painted these veins of orange across the otherwise green mountains. And the visiting church groups became less frequent. And we began downsizing the village in preparation for the harsh winter. I ate dinner with her in the dining hall one night and she asked me if I could keep a secret. We bust our dishes and I followed her down to the center of the village where two pine trees grew at the side of the road. They were tall pine trees, but still adolescent, still a bit spry in the branches, still with room to grow. And they grew only about eight feet apart, close enough so that some of their branches interleaved. And sometime, years before I arrived, the village staff sawed off all the lower branches. They did this to keep kids like me from climbing up into the trees and falling to their death on the rocks below. I still wanted to climb the trees, but I didn't know how. And so she showed me the secret handholds, these little knobbly stumps of branches sawed off for the specific purpose of preventing exactly what she was showing me how to do. She grabbed onto these and pulled herself a couple steps into the tree, then into the waiting branches, and then she kept going. I found the same handholds and followed right behind. Thirty feet above the ground, the world feels different somehow, more spacious. Everything below looks flatter and balder. And the breezes up there, they tend to pick up stray thoughts and blow them in your direction. We sat there, invisible in the branches. The evening bell drew people to the village center, calling them for evening worship. They filtered in. She asked me why I came to the village, and I told her that I might want to spend my life with God, become a pastor. She asked me if I believed in God, and I said yes. She asked me why I believed in God, and I told her about the true miracles of the Bible, Jesus and Moses and Daniel the pacifist, friend of the lions. She asked me how I knew the stories were true, and I told her that I couldn't prove it, but that I had faith in them. And faith requires no proof, as faith is unprovable. That's what makes it faith. The sky turned from a medium blue to a dark indigo, and she asked me what faith was. If it had been anyone else, I would have responded cynically. But that's because I'd usually gotten these kind of questions from adults who seemed keen on teaching me valuable lessons, conversations with expected endings. But this, this felt entirely different. Her questions were earnest. They didn't have a desired outcome, just simply asking the question, what is faith and why do you have it? So. Sitting there in the tree, at the safety of the trunk, it bothered me that an honest question could make me feel so uncomfortable. So I asked her the same questions back, and she said that she didn't know. But unlike me, she didn't seem at all ruffled by her unknowing. People walked by below us, and she pointed out to me the people that she suspected to be truly Christian. But she also pointed out the Buddhists, the agnostics, the pagans, the atheists, all filing into the church's service together. The sun was fully gone by now. The sky seemed musty and purple. And in the dimness there, without warning, she stood up from our conversation and grabbed the long branches above her. She looked at me in the eyes and said, follow me. 
She stepped away from the safety of the tree trunk, a branch under each foot and one in each hand. One step, then a second step, and then a long reach of the arm away from our tree and into the outstretched branches of the next one over. She pulled herself across the gap and into the safety of the other giant pine, hugging its trunk. She looked at me again in the eyes. Follow me. And I looked down at my feet. And I looked at the canyon of empty air between us. And I saw the death on the rocks that awaited my clumsiness. So I carefully climbed back down to the ground and headed off to church. Winter showed up in the form of giant snowstorms and daily power outages. It was shockingly cold at times. We carved snow staircases down to the entrances of buildings, and in the shortness of daytime, the sun barely crested the high ridge between the mountains before it drew back down behind them again. She knew I was in love with her, and it wasn't going to happen, but she was nice about it anyways. During the long nights, we sat in the dining hall, drinking tea with her constituted milk, eating whole wheat bread with honey. My imagined future plan for us was off the rails. And what's more, I was still rolling her questions around in my head. I already doubted the existence of God, but I feared hell just the same. At night, my prayers were like apologies. I apologized for doubting my faith, and for sinning, and for not doing things more rightly. But even these apology prayers became less frequent. My internal compass was shifting, with or without my consent. I felt a declination growing inside of me, an ever-growing gap between what I felt and what I suspected. I still went to church each night, I kept singing the hymns, kept sharing the peace, kept communing in the body of Christ, given for you, Jeff, given for you. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. But I decided to stop saying the end of the Nicene Creed, which just felt a bit too declarative to me. And we believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. By the time I left the village, the last vestiges of snow were gone. I was 17, spiritually melted and morally askew. And I kept going back to that night in the tree. I wondered what would have been different had I been able to cross the gap that night. What would have happened had I spent just a moment with nothing but air and thin branches below me? Maybe that's what faith is. Or maybe that's just being a dumbass. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. Salah. When I was 18, I went to college on a hill overlooking a bay. And below, the city, the remnants of an old paper mill, endless freight trains rolling by, the marshes and the forest and the coastline all wrapping northwards up towards the distant orange glow of an oil refinery. I showed up at college feeling excited and somewhat dissonant, but I did find some answers in that first year, and those answers came the same way the questions did, with a little bit of time and a little bit of altitude. I can explain. It didn't take long for me to fall for someone new, She lived in my dorm, and we talked a lot. She was brilliant and adventurous, and we climbed things together, we trespassed. She taught me how to find free rosemary bread in the dumpsters behind the bakery. She liked me, and I liked her, but it wasn't the right time then. It rarely is. 
She once asked me if I could keep a secret. She said I'd need my sleeping bag. So I packed mine tight until my Jansport bulged conspicuously. She did the same and found some extra room for oranges. And we walked into the campus library just before closing time. I followed her up some flights of stairs and we waited for the last of the students to go home for the night. And then we were alone. And she showed me this little window. And I kept watch while she jiggled the latch just so. It swung open onto a subroof and we climbed out. I closed the window behind us, but made sure it didn't latch. And by the time I turned around again, she was already halfway up the access ladder, so I followed. We walked to the roof's edge, and below us the city went to bed, and the night birds circled, and the distant fires of the oil refinery lit the northern sky orange. We let the moon warm our backs for a while, and I felt the wind blow its wayward thoughts in my direction. We spread our sleeping bags on the soft roof, and we laid next to each other and looked at the sky, and I didn't feel calm. I worried that we'd be found out and expelled for trespassing. I worried that she didn't like me the same way that I liked her. I worried that hellfire might still await me for the thoughts I thought and the deeds I did. And I worried that death might just be an empty void, a sudden end. You know, all the normal stuff. We did eat oranges, though, and we pointed out the shapes in the clouds, and we listened as the night birds settled into their roosts and the trains came in, and for me, that was good enough to make me realize that sometimes it's just fine to believe a couple different things at once. We slept with a few layers of synthetic down separating us, and we held each other. And as we slept, we tossed and turned, and the God who I'd ceased to believe in parted the clouds just a bit to watch our bodies spinning like little compass needles, orienting along the Earth's magnetic meridians. As I was writing this script, I came to the realization that the word parable is closely related to the word parabola, that shape that mathematics uses to describe the path of flying arrows and bullets and baseballs. The arcs of stories are parabolic, too. Good stories return to where they started, but show the distance they've traveled. And bad stories squiggle all over the place. Maybe they stop to smell the flowers too much. Or maybe they fail to impart a clear moral. Or maybe those stories can be good, too. I don't know. Anyways, all this to say, religion affected me in a big way. I know that when people say that phrase, they usually mean that it did something bad to them, but I don't mean it that way. I think religion was a net positive for me. And I think that sometimes I write these start-of-season episodes a little bit like sermons or parables. So maybe I did become a pastor after all. I went back home this summer. Two of the neighbors had moved away. One of them had died. My parents' garden was as big as I've ever seen it. And the road got paved. Not sure when or why that happened, but now the drivers speed with impunity. One night while I was out there, the three of us sat on the porch in the same place we always have, facing the newly paved road off to our north. And we ate dinner. They had a roasted chicken, a side of microwaved peas from the garden, whole wheat bread with butter, and I ate a pizza with olives, and I drank a beer. A car roared in the distance, but now there was no plume of dust behind it. From its pitch alone, I could hear its speed, maybe 50 or 60 miles an hour. We watched it approach, speeding over the railroad crossing, the same thought entering our three minds simultaneously. But I didn't say it, not because I didn't want to, but because my mom beat me to it. Why do they drive so fast? Don't they know they'll wind up in the ditch?
Magnetic North is changing and no one knows exactly why. It's moving eastwards about 40 miles per year. It's possible that we're due for another magnetic reversal, a process where our magnetic poles suddenly swap places with little notice. North becomes south and south becomes north. The effects could be devastating for our communication systems and for migrating animals. And there might be a host of other unforeseen consequences. Maybe it would be disastrous, or maybe it'd be just fine. Maybe we would just have to hold our maps upside down for the next hundred thousand years. No one really knows. I used to get lost a lot. I still do. I just try not to worry about it so much these days. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. The hills melted like wax at the presence of the Lord. The hills melted like wax. My name is Jeff Emptman. I produced this episode of Here Be Monsters with a lot of help, namely the help of my co-producer Bethany Denton. I also had some help remembering things in this episode, so a big thank you to Johanna Gilia, who helped me remember some of our tree conversation, and a big thank you to Hallie Sloan for helping me remember our trip to the library roof. I appreciate these two so much, as well as everyone else who's ever been patient with me. And a thank you to Hannah Susanna, who let me record her amazing wind chimes for this episode. They sound like this. I also played some biblical recordings in this episode, which came from LibriVox, which is this huge free collection of audiobooks made by volunteers. The readers you heard included Sam Stinson, Ann Chang, Von Ullman, and some other anonymous contributors. Thank you. Okay, I have some exciting news. We have a new Here Be Monsters sticker, and these just came in the mail, and they look so good. We have them designed by the amazing artist Violet Reed. And the design, it's a can of worms, literally a can of worms, and it's printed on holographic paper. And I could tell you more about it, but it wouldn't do any good because you just have to see this design because it looks so good and Violet did such a good job. The stickers are up on our website right now, and you can get yours at hbmpodcast.com slash store. Okay, Here Be Monsters is distributed by KCRW. Our senior editor there used to be Nick White, but Nick's off doing some other things these days, and so now Kristen Lepore is in charge of us. We get additional support for our freelance contributions from KCRW's Independent Producer Project. Music on this episode came from The Black Spot. All right, thanks for listening. More episodes soon.